This will be the last you'll hear of me this evening, I promise. It's a, it's a great privilege for me to introduce the hardest working man in the province, Spike McKinnon. It was 1937 that Michael Spike McKinnon was born to Cassie and Willie McKinnon. Spike was the youngest member of the family, his sister Teresa and brother Dan Willie are present here this evening. His brothers D.A. and Jelly, John Jelly, are deceased. Spike was, ma is, was married and is married to his lovely wife, Lucille, in 1964. Lucille is the daughter of the legendary basketball coach, Jack McKenzie. Spike and Lil's, Lucille's three children, Paula, Lisa, and Keith, are present this evening. There you go, buddy, you're off the hook. You can relax. All these guys think I'm going to rip them, eh? I wonder why. Back in Spike's day, there was very little opportunity to participate in organized sports. Like many others of that era, Spike developed his athletic skills in the neighborhood and at Mount Carmel School. <laughs> Sorry, that's just a fact. Spike basically concentrated on two sports growing up, basketball and baseball. He was an excellent basketball player who learned the sport at the Strand and Mount Carmel Gym. Spike was a key member of the New Waterford Strands during one of the finest runs in maritime basketball history. A run that ended with nine maritime and Nova Scotia senior championships. Spike was, I watched him play, believe it or not, he was a deft playmaker. You can look that word up, Bernie. <laughs> and a good outside shooter on the Marshall Laveau coach teams. I couldn't help that. It wasn't planned. But it was the sport of baseball that led Spike to notoriety. In 1954, Spike's first organized baseball experience resulted in a Nova Scotia Midget Championship. And some of these other guys were on the same team, as you, as you pretty well gathered. Eh? For his Mount Carmel squad, coached by Gervais Fortune. The team repeated the feat in the summer of 55. The nucleus of this team was destined for even greater things, as you already learned. As they continued, to advance on the Nova Scotia baseball circuit, winning provincial junior championships under J coach Jim Fox Chessa. They lost the maritime title in a heartbreaking defeat to Edmonston, New Brunswick, in a tremendous pitching duel between Spike and the Edmonston hurler, with Spike and his New Otter for teammates finishing on the losing end of a one nothing game. Now let's break down this four-year feat by these New Otter for boys. The baseball they played was the highest class available. They were the only, there was only one class, not like today, when there, if you can walk, there's a classification for you. <laughs> so coming from a small town, these highly skilled youngsters were often competing with teams with much greater pools to draw from, towns and cities with greater populations. Probably their biggest obstacle at the time was Halifax. Typical, right? You have to go through Halifax. It's really tough to beat a Halifax squad because of their population and their facilities. Well, that Halifax squad was led by a former coach of mine, Eric Parsons. Parsons was a giant of a man, especially for those times. He was a fierce competitor with a great baseball lineage, as his brother Wilson played in the New York Yankee organization. Parsons went on to play with the Dartmouth Arrows in the famous H&D League. So for four years, Spike and his teammates had to get by Parsons and his Halifax team to win these consecutive championships at different levels. The pitching, pitching duels between Southpaw, Spike, and Parsons are legendary, and they offer one striking statistic. Spike outpitched pitched Parsons and went undefeated against him during those four years, a remarkable achievement. In the fall of 1956, Spike and Mike Roberts attended a pro evaluation camp at the Sydney Whitney Pier Stadium. Now, I was only young, and I just barely saw that stadium. That was a real baseball stadium. It was beautiful. Still not standing, but it was beautiful. So the, the camp was conducted by Jeff Jones, the head scout for the Milwaukee Braves, and Eddie Gillis, a local who was a legendary baseball in the Calgary League and was the regional scout. 
Although the quality of players at this camp was exceptional, only two players were offered trial camps with the Braves. The two players were both Spike and Mike Roberts. It was a proud moment for these young lads, but also recognition of the players being developed in the New Waterford area and a testament to the coaching these boys had received to that point. But I'm going to tell you a story that few people know. I don't know. If anybody hasn't talked to me, they probably don't know it, and I'm not sure if Stan Axel knows it either. Um, I, my father played with Eddie Gillis in, in Kentville in the H&D League, and, and Eddie Gillis was from Wood Avenue in Waterford, and I lived on Wilson Avenue. And he would be home in the summers, and he would be hanging around Johnny Miles' father's store. So I'd ask him. I'd be trying to pick his brain about almost anything that was about sports. And so I asked him about Mike and, and Spikey and how good they were and everything. He said, well, yeah, they were. They could have been pro players. We would have break here and there. And um, so I asked him about that camp. He said, but a lot of people don't know this about the camp. Now, the best players, it might have been even uh, in eastern Nova Scotia, so there's probably guys from Stellarton, New Glasgow, Anakinish. There was all kinds of ball players, and I've talked to some guys that were there, like Leo Doyle and guys like Stan who would know, and these guys that were there, Bobby Ferguson, all these guys would have been there. But Eddie Gillis told me that they had their eye on Mike and they had their eye on Spike, and then when Stan came to bat in at the field, um, Jeff Jones and Eddie are standing off to the side, somebody's pitching them in, and there's balls ricocheting off the fence, there's balls going over the fence. And now you've got to set the... the the picture here. These guys were going to be offered to go to a camp where they would compete for a pro contract the following year. Jeff Jones said to Eddie, what's this kid's name? And he, Eddie told him, Stan Exile. He said, I can take him to spring training in the spring. That's how good this guy is. And then he told him to run to first base. And <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not telling this to embarrass him because it was already alluded. I wouldn't tell it, only I knew it was, uh, uh, Stan even alluded to it himself. But in those days, there was no such thing as a designated hitter. This man, I watched him play. He, like, this guy could have been a pro ball player. It was amazing. It's an amazing story. And I don't know, did you know that story, Stan? No? Okay. Okay, so he, there, two players from this tiny village. Okay, and here's another thing. We're at this, they're at this big trial camp in Sydney, and the two players from a tiny village of Lingan are almost selected for a poll contract. And that's an interesting point to consider when talking about local baseball. I'm sorry, Spike, we'll have to put you in the back burner here. <laughs> it's that the village of Lingan has made significant contribution to the player pool of several errors. And Lionel and Dougie Petrie are examples of players produced in the late 40s and the early 50s. Now, two of the finest players in the province came out of Lingan in the late 50s in the persons of Mike Roberts and Stan Exile. Hard to imagine a better tandem of players from such a small area in the history of baseball in this province. That's how good these two are, Stan and Mike. Ling Gan also has a notoriety on the world stage. And most people here would recognize the name Babe Ruth as being the greatest baseball player of all time. Well, Babe was taught to play baseball by a Ling Gan native brother, Matthias Bootler. And, Bo and that was at, Bootler was a, bro a brother, I don't know what order he was, but he was a brother, he was six foot six, 250 pounds, and he had Babe Ruth at the St. Mary's Boys School in Baltimore, and he put the fear of God in uh, Babe Ruth, and Ruth considers him as his greatest teacher and the guy that contributed the most to him as a baseball player and also as making him uh, a productive human being as he was quite incorrigible at the time. Anyhow, I digress a little bit, but Ling Gann had an amazing impact on baseball diamond, both locally and in the international stage. Amazing, really. Now back to Spike. In the spring of 1957, both Mike and Sp Sp Spike headed south to Waycross, Georgia, to compete for a professional contract in the Braves organization. Both received contract offers, with Mike accepting and eventually spending two years in the Braves organization before an ankle an ankle injury curtailed his pro aspirations. Now you gotta remember there wasn't as many teams as, as there was now. These guys were, could have been pro ball players. Now Spike's a different story, if you can imagine. As, as he declined the offer, 
preferring to head home to pursue work. Now you can just imagine, this guy is offered a pro contract of 500 a month, which was good money in those days, and he would, decides he would rather head home to work. Well, for a guy like me, that's hard to figure. But I guess it worked out, pun intended, for Spike, because at the age of 80, he continues to, de to hold down a full-time job. <laughs> Working as a liquor inspector, Although the complexity of that job is often debated by the Knights of the Round Table at Tim Hortons. <laughs> but seriously, Spike McKinnon was one of the finest pitchers ever developed on the island, and indeed the province. He was a crafty pitcher with a smooth delivery, hit above average fastball to go along with his devastating knuckle curve. His walk to strike ratio was outstanding, signifying that he had pinpoint control. Spike was also an outstanding feeling pitcher with a very deceptive pickoff move. He has pitched a no-hitter and several one-hitters. He's recorded many double-digit strikeout games. Spike was a key member of the 1959 and 65 Giants, the winners of two maritime championship banners for our town. When you add it all up, as far as championship teams, this is incredible, Spike played between baseball and basketball. You come up with 11 Nova Scotia and five maritime banners. So he played on 16 championship teams, an amazing feat. It gives me great pleasure to ask Spike McKinnon to come forward and receive his plaque, signifying his introduction into the Waterford and District Sports Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Spike. Great speech, buddy. <laughs> I, I had a lot more for you. <laughs> but first of all, I'd like to thank the Nwalaburn District Territory Sports Hall of Fame Committee for this honor. Uh, I'm not going to say too much because it's going to be repetitive. And uh, I want to tell a Fox Chestnut story. Oh, great. We were playing in Halifax in 56, Nova Scotia Championship. And anybody ever hear of Fanny Tanner? Two guys does. He was the one of the most fearless hitters in the province. So the bases were all and there was two out. Fox calls time. He said, and that's me. Let's walk him. Walk in and run. I said, no. I'm not going to walk in no run. <laughs> so he said, pitch careful. I'll pitch careful to him. Came, the count came to three and two. I threw one way over his head. He just swung at him. <laughs> The rest was history. <laughs> <laughs> That's Fox. He only on the walk. But uh, getting back to tonight, it's a great honor for me to be honored, especially when you get honored with your brother, who, who I carried. <laughs> As to my brother-in-law, Bucky, who will carry four of us. Thank you. Good job,